Okay, very good morning guys. It is Monday, 6th of July. Hope you all had a fantastic weekend. Before I begin my kind of look ahead for the for the week, just wanted to mention on Wednesday evening, as you can see here to the side of me, we're holding a webinar between 5 to 6 p.m. London time. And it's gonna be on the importance of risk management. So obviously one of the main cornerstones of any successful and consistent trading strategy. So I'll be joined by the head of trading peers, some of our other guys, Alex and Sam, will also be on the call, but it's an open invitation. The registration link is in the description of this video. And it's gonna be in association with Aria Trading, who have a pretty neat software solution as well regarding specifically risk management, which I think you, you guys would find uh, particularly interesting. So hopefully you can join us. That'll be on Wednesday. Do feel free. It'll be capped at 500 people online via Zoom. So hopefully I'll see you then. But let's talk about markets and what's going on and what's driving things this morning. And as you can see, a definite case of risk on atmosphere. Um, equity markets overnight in China were up in excess of 4%. Actually, it was the biggest one day move higher in Chinese equities in a year. Uh, amid positive commentary on the market from state media. And this comes after last week as well, the market there domestically was up 7%. Um, the front page editorial in the Securities Times basically today said that they're fostering a healthy bull market after the pandemic is now more important to the economy than ever. Um, the number of mainland commentaries and retweets containing the term bull market um, over the weekend was more than 10 times the average of the past 90 days according to the Baidu index. Um, so the article in itself underpinning uh, the accelerated gains in stock market reforms and excess global liquidity was the main things that they were kind of talking about. So as such, um, you can see this feeding right through into the, uh, the kind of index futures. I mean, the DAX already up, although it's off its highs, it's still up 262 points. Uh, U.S. stock futures obviously reopening after the extended weekend and despite some of the uh, coronavirus situation impeding somewhat some of the Independence Day 4th of July celebrations that very much being brushed aside which in itself I'll talk about in more detail I think is a very important thing the way the market is now perceiving the still somewhat accelerated numbers in North America and basically disregarding them for the time being. Uh, so the Nasdaq's up about 125, the S&P up 36. Um, in step with that then, although it's bumped up a little bit as Europe has come in, gold is still down about six and a half dollars and the US 10 year down four um, ticks at the moment. So yeah, it's a, a very much a reflection of that. Uh, just generally um, confidence in the short term, I guess, over the situation and, and led by Asia. So how long this just general risk appetite can be maintained today will be interesting to see um, because this is very much a, a China narrative that seemingly has given the markets a bit of a boost. So I think when the US starts to come in, returning from their holiday and the situation, as they said, on the coronavirus nationally there isn't good still. Um, the markets managed to look over that for now. I'll be interested to see how it performs later on this afternoon, whether we get a little bit of profit taking on some of the moves that have been seen overnight will be interesting. Um, in the currency markets, the Dixie's actually come off considerably, so it continues to be somewhat tied to general risk sentiment as a barometer almost. And the Dixie's actually down almost half a percent, so it's a really quite an aggressive downward move seen in the overnight session. So in the currency pairs in the top left, euro dollar, uh, and cable both on the front foot. The euro, uh, in fact, is up about 60 pips, close proximity to the high that we're seeing towards the back end of last week. And you know, on the weekly, we'll be continuing to keep an eye on some key upside levels coming in. Um, the the weekly highs that we're seeing last two weeks, both are pretty much around the same level. Uh, and then that longer term trend line going back to 2018 will be uh, interesting for sure to watch for at, throughout the week. Um, but let's have a look at Overall, some of the headline stories, there is a, a full technical analysis uh, video done by Sam that he issued on the Amplify Trading YouTube channel. If you just scroll down to his playlist, you'll be able to see that and he'll go over the charts in way more detail from a technical perspective. Uh, but for me, just having a look at then through the headlines, this is as I just described, um, people were looking at the CSI 300, the kind of biggest companies in China and reporting it's most overheated since 2014 after gains continuing to accelerate. Brokerages are reported to be talking about this kind of 
daily turnover topping one trillion yuan, which is very rarely seen. So you know, it's, it's kind of the, the most amount of activity that we've had in a long time. Uh, and this is what the chart looks like. It probably helps with a bit of context, actually. This is looking at the onset of the pandemic. And you'll remember it was around the timings of right at the beginning of the year, because uh, this was very much happening, the spread of the virus in mainland China before then we kind of went into that second and third phase of the outbreak that moved to South Korea, Iran, Italy, and then beyond. Um, so it was happening quite early in this year. And that was that first dip that we had um, when the market plummeted due to coronavirus. Uh, it was then relatively contained before we saw the global spread and then the consequent um, pandemic situation develop. Uh, and that was when we hit that overall low um, at around that time going into March. But the recovery has been awesome, just like it has been in all the other global indices, but probably even more stretched in the case of China. Um, and as I said, the, the kind of state media kind of pumping it up a little bit and, and definitely the state just naturally control over these types of things probably a lot more direct than say other western developed nations and then continuing to pin it on stock market reforms and excess global liquidity and we've just had this real sharp acceleration here in the last few weeks as you can see um, on the point actually of the of what they've pinned it on and that latter um, suggestion of excess global liquidity here was an interesting um, report that came out um, overnight or over the weekend from JP Morgan, the US bank. Uh, they were basically saying that extremely loose monetary policy will be required for a long time to support growing debt levels worldwide, buoying liquidity along with global equity and bond prices. Um, so JP Morgan essentially saying that this is going to further inflate um, the market essentially. Uh, as we continue to get back on our feet economically. So it kind of fits lockstep with what the Chinese state media were saying. Um, and then some of the other things that people have been looking at is Goldman's have come out with a, with a research note as well over the weekend. And they were talking about the fact that uh, essentially there's still decent risk reward for Chinese stocks, not unless US-China relations substantially deteriorate from here. But what they're saying then is they're, they're supporting their call for being overweight China in a regional context. Uh, the stocks that appear most exposed to US-China relations are technology companies and ADRs, while domestic demand-focused consumption and healthcare names should be relatively immune. So that makes pretty much makes sense. Anything tied to any exposure that could be subject to, say, tariffs or um, the kind of demand for, for import-export orders from China, sure or anything with American related listing. But when it comes to a more domestic focused narrative and companies that are dependent on that domestic story in China, then they should continue to outperform. And for those interested, if you were um, wanting to have a look, there is actually in this article <clears throat> that you can find on Bloomberg, a full name of the actual companies that tend to underperform and also outperform. Uh, the actual Chinese companies' names it could be quite interesting. Uh, to monitor but yeah Goldman's also they they have what they call uh, a, a kind of a, a meter or a barometer of just generally US China relations I know this is a bit small to look at on my screen here but I have retweeted it um, or tweeted it this morning if you want to click on it and have a closer look but it's an annotated um, graphic going back to January 2018 when we saw the initial kind of intensification of tensions between the two nations and that was when we were going through that kind of tit for tat process in 2018-19 of the ever increasing uh, tariff rates. Uh, but if you look where we are at the moment, I mean obviously it's been incredibly volatile um, relations between the two nations through much of 2019. But here, after peaking in recent weeks amid China planning, and obviously, as we've seen now, implementing the new security laws for Hong Kong, things have dropped off quite substantially, uh, in fact. And so in that regard, they would see it uh, from their specific measurement uh, as being far from the peak of where the most intense tensions have, have been in the past, um, and more recently from that Hong Kong situation. Um, so yeah, I mean that pretty much sums up really the overnight um, moves. So as I said, definitely a, a risk on feeling uh, to the open. But in my mind, this is somewhat a continuation, and perhaps I'll be proved wrong. But 
um, the, the driving force of what's helped futures pop up and fairly aggressively um, in the overnight session has been that Chinese story. Uh, and I just wonder how how long that can last for because typically the markets at the moment are very much driven much more from a US kind of, it's more US centric uh, and also with the updates on the, the COVID situation being I think more of a focal point for uh, Western markets than it would be for the Far East. So definitely um, from an underlying economic situation, I mean I don't think that China is out of the woods yet either. Uh, and as much as some of the recent PMI data that we saw last week has continued to suggest general expansion is returning, um, I just think with a lot of this, it's kind of a bit of um, state intervention almost, talking it up, looking to squeeze every drop out of this kind of bull market kind of ideology and, and, and just squeezing it up to what is, uh, by some measurements, quite an overbought market when you're looking at the, uh, the CSI 300 in China at the moment. Um, update then on the COVID situation. Um, let's have a look at things and what are we looking at. And so I thought this was quite interesting actually as it tells quite a distinct story of what's happening globally at this present point in time. Uh, in the UK we continue to see a decrease in the seven day rolling average of new cases uh, per million in COVID. And that is a positive kind of signal because of course we've gone through the next kind of phase of reopening so if you are out and about in the UK this weekend one of the first times you can go and sit in a coffee shop have a pint of beer in the pub and, and so on so this is the uh, a real key milestone now for getting the economy back up and running but obviously as I've said many times before the next two weeks the second half of this month will be particularly interesting to see um, whether or not we start to see a, a, a pickup again of the next kind of second wave of, of viruses in, in the UK. So the UK for the moment is, uh, is heading in the right direction, suggestion of control containing the virus. Um, in Europe, pretty similar. It's kind of static, uh, kind of plateauing. So there hasn't been a, an elevated second wave despite some blips that we've seen in the likes of Germany their country still remains in that reproductive rate, just slightly below that one level, importantly. But the two areas that have been growing quite rapidly, America is obviously the one that gets the most attention, just given just uh, their demo demographic, the, the size of their population, the number of cases is now particularly large. Um, and a lot of these states have started to, to reverse, if you like, the reopening process, particularly on the Sun Belt, so those southern states uh, in particular. Uh, the other country down here at the bottom, which actual case numbers are, are much lower, it's coming from a much lower base, but it is Australia. And you can see the trajectory of the curve for Australia is incredibly steep here at the moment. And what's happened here, and this was actually an underperforming market in the overnight trade, was actually the Australian market. Uh, the number of COVID-19 cases in Melbourne, uh, Victoria's capital, has surged in recent days. The state reported 127 new COVID-19 infections overnight, and that is the biggest one-day spike since the pandemic has begun. And it has led, for the first time, the border between Victoria and New South Wales has been shut in 100 years. So they're taking these, you know, pretty unprecedented historical steps to try and contain now the movement of people in these highly infectious areas. Uh, and that ha is going to have, of course, implications on the economic recovery of Australia, uh, given these are quite key areas uh, in that regard. So yeah, Australia continues to face quite a challenging time at the moment. UK and Europe is still relatively positive and the US continues to track in a, in a negative fashion. But at this point, at a rate of which it would appear, markets still are relatively comfortable with, at least for the time being. Um, from a numbers point of view, total cases now in the US nearing on uh, 3 million. You can see here on the seven day average, we continue to remain on a fairly steep incline. So I guess over the next week or two we're looking for where does that plateau um, and then on a state by state level you can see here the areas like california texas florida which have been those key ones and do comprise of the three largest most popular states in the entire united states of america case numbers generally are still rising at this point in time and and obviously from a beyond the intraday and perhaps right here right now this of course is going to have implications then for 
the political favorability of the president uh, and this is going to be a real talking point obviously that he'll have to defend and on that note you've had Donald Trump tweet overnight of course um, new China virus cases up because of massive testing deaths are down low and steady the fake news media should report this and also that new job numbers are setting records says so you know he's he's hitting a lot of things here in this one tweet he's blaming the virus you know he calls the virus it's the chinese virus it's not it's not a virus it's the chinese virus again looking to disassociate that anything that he's done is that is his fault deaths are down and they're trying to link that to the fact that it's testing that then is making that number look higher and then also talking about that people that the media is biased in the fact that it's not reporting about the good things like the jobs number that we had last thursday so it's kind of classic 101 political gamesmanship going on but of course we'll continue to be monitoring this because as far as the bookies are concerned as far as the average poll of polls nationally in america uh, biden still is the favorite by quite a clear distance at the moment so he really does need to get a, a handle on this uh, and soon and, and when it comes to Donald Trump that probably means that you know he, he's not a passive guy he's going to be out there being assertive and the aggressor uh, so much more from him to come this week I'm sure looking at the actual uh, calendar for this week it is uh, it is pretty quiet um, there's not a great deal going on here um, as far as today is concerned you have had some German numbers come out this morning German industrial orders uh, month to month 10.4% which was slightly weaker than expected but no real impact for markets here. Um, you have got this afternoon the ISM non-manufacturing so this was the quite unusual quirk given the holiday shortened week last week was that normally we would look at something like this ISM figure for the employment component to gauge them better the employment situation ahead of the labour report on, on payrolls but we're actually seeing this after so um, how important this is yeah, I mean, it's worth monitoring. I don't think it's going to be a massive game changer, to be quite honest. But the ISM non manufacturing number is expected to move back into expansionary territory um, above 50 from its previous 45.4, which in itself should be quite meaningful. But again, how long that this can be sustained, given perhaps confidence will start to be dented, given the re pickup that we've seen or re acceleration in a number of these key states in America and the COVID 19 situation. So, how, how much you can buy into just one month reading, given that we know in the here and now things are changing quite fluidly, I'm not so sure. Um, other than that, it's pretty quiet. Um, Tuesday. Uh, equally so overnight though by this time tomorrow we'll have the latest RBA um, interest rate announcement rates are expected to remain as they are um, going into Wednesday and Thursday again very quiet trade balance data coming out of Germany on the latter and then Friday um, we get again pretty quiet nothing really major coming out of the US some, some Japanese inflation linked data an Italian sovereign debt update coming out from Fitch uh, and then also the other thing to look out for this week is the the recommencement of course uh, I believe it's in London this week is the trade negotiations or the trade pack or Brexit between that of the UK and Europe but no really massive headlines I'd say on that regard so far seen over the weekend UK national press uh, so that is it I'm going to leave you with that um, hopefully then you can join me on Wednesday the link to register for this free webinar will be in the description of the video if you're watching this on YouTube. So just go ahead and register. You'll get an alert then when we do go live and a reminder uh, at the time. But any questions, just feel free to leave a comment and I'll wish you a fantastic week ahead. All right, thanks very much, guys.